working our way through the Psalms of Ascent. In fact, this is week 14 in that series. It's also the last week in that series. We've been doing these responsive reading prayers, and we're going to start with our last one. So let's, uh, let's read our way through this one together. If it says uh, congregation, that's all y'all. If it says mint, this is the 14th time. I don't have to do that, do I? Sorry, you'll figure it out. Come bless the Lord. Who stand by night in the house of the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. You That's it. It's a short one. So you're probably getting your hopes up that it'll be a short sermon. But <laughs> Have we met? Uh, <laughs> I'm Ethan. Ah. Uh, for 14 weeks now, we have gathered with Israel around our campfires to pray their songs. As Matt reminded us, a song can transport you out of this world and into another one. And the reason for singing these songs is because the people who are, who are making these journeys were headed to a place where they needed hearts that had been transported into another world. They needed their hearts shaped in preparation. The the wise among Israel, the faithful, the ones who who were ripe and ready when the Messiah came, they were hearts that had known, okay, I'm a broken mess. I really am. And even to enter into the presence of God, I need God's help. And so God gave these songs to prepare the people to be with Him. You remember where it all started? with our own lying lips? What do I do with my deceiving and world-shaped nature? For too long, I've been out there in the world. For too long, I've been shaped with priorities that aren't yours. How will I be ready? And so these songs are meant to get us ready. And throughout this stuff, it has been reminding us, you know what, I've got so much mess before I get there that I've got to clean up. And you and I, folks, are on the same journey. Except our journey isn't a three times a year journey. It's a journey of life. And when we get to the Jerusalem to which we are headed, we won't go home. Because that is home. And so like ancient Israel, preparing their hearts to enter into the presence of God, so we have been making this journey for this year. Singing these songs and looking in saying, oh man, when I look around me and I see the dangerous hills, my first t- tendency is to self-protect. But you have reminded me to fall back on you that my help comes from the Lord. When I encounter people, they treat me with entirely too much contempt. And if I let that stuff rot inside of me, I will be awful, but I don't want that. I want to be with you. I got to remember that I got to pray for the place where I encounter God. I need to pray for the city, pray for the church, because I, I need the church's shaping influence in me. The good of this city is the good of me. So I pray these blessings on this place. And oh, what do I do with my sins? God, if, if you don't forgive, then none of us can stand to this whole journey we've been preparing, looking in, looking at God, seeking his help. Finally, we have made it home. We've come to the place of the holy place. We've arrived in the holy city. And we've come to the place where all of the, what all of this was for. Remember that you're supposed to go to this city three times a year for the festival. Three times a year to come and, and celebrate with God. Be in God's presence and tell God's story. All of the festivals were to remind you of the great redemptive acts of God. And you're supposed to celebrate and rejoice over how God is such a blessing in your life. And so all of this has been preparing us to enter into this concept of blessings. But as I studied this week, (laughs) you know, the the funny thing is is that that as I read these, and, and as I myself have been doing the work to prepare to give you this stuff. I've been encountering over and over again, oh yeah, that's leading me to the blessing of God. If I will deal appropriately with contempt, if I will give that to God and let Him worry about it, and I just respond with the grace and love that God expects me to deal with, then I'm going to have a better life. 
And so I'm coming to God seeking His blessing, seeking His good, right? If I will, if I will come and I will deal with sin appropriately and I will remember properly humble myself and I will, if I will put myself in the correct place with God, I'm going to have a much better life. I'm going to have blessing because I've come to the blesser with it. Throughout this series, I've been kind of pitching these things that way. And in fact, that's incredibly common. If you look up the word blessing, this is the kind of perspective you run into. Today, God will restore you and elevate you and rescue you and defend you. God will surely bless you. Because that, after all, is God's job, right? And that's what He's supposed to do. We go to God and we get blessed. You know, The life that doesn't spend time in God's presence is not a blessed life. The life that doesn't come to God with what it really is and seek God's reorientation can't really soak in the blessing. So it remains, even if it's coming to God, if it comes to God with an angry fist, with a hard heart, it's not going to get blessing. But that's, that's the way this is supposed to work. God is supposed to bless us. It works this way. You know, God is source. And from God comes blessings to God's creation, right? But as I began work with this psalm, this startling reality hit me that the arrow has flipped over in this psalm. Do you see it? Did you see that? Did you read that? The opening word is not come receive blessing from the Lord. The opening word is come bless the Lord. What? Me? I don't know about the rest of you. I can't see your interior world, but I know what resources I've got. I know what I have to offer. And I'm not sure that it's that. I can deal pretty easily with that first word. I mean, that's a delight. Come. That through the whole journey, you've been hoping that He would say, come to Me. That's why the people got up and they left their homes. And they sat out and they, they sang around campfires. The reason they made this journey is because the hopefulness that they would be welcome into the presence of God. And as we arrive and we finally get to the holy city as we leave behind campfires and we go sleep in the house of a relative, maybe even a bed tonight, you hear the invitation. Come. Which is in and of itself a little bit surprising. At least it is for me. Because when I hear God say, I want you. My first inclination, if I don't work really hard to say, okay, you're smarter than I am, my first inclination is to say, why? Why on earth would you want me? After who I've been? After what I've done? After what I still am? With all my mess, surely you have better people to call to you than me. And God says, it's not about that. I want you. Son, daughter, come here. But I'm a mess. I don't care. Come. I've messed it all up. I don't belong. Come. But there are all these failures in my life and I can, I can point them out to you. I can show them to you. It doesn't matter. Come. Whoever you are. Whatever you've done. Come. This is Word of God giving that invitation. And you are trained to pray it, to sing it, so that you will believe it. Because if you don't hear Him say come, you'll try and get your life cleaned up first, and then you'll be able to come to... No. No, you come, and He cleans up your life. I can handle that first word. Come. Okay. Okay. What on earth is that doing there? What do I do with that? Come, bless the Lord? God, I got nothing. Every good thing in me, you put there. I, I am not responsible for the good in me, I'm a mess. 
the stuff that's in me that I'm responsible, that I can say, yep, that one's mine. I know that came from me. is because He would never do it. And i got all kinds of that junk in me. It's difficult for me to forgive. It's easy for Him to forgive. You know, I know that because I look at Him and I see Him forgiving people who murdered His son. Murder my son, I'm going to have trouble with you. It's easy for Him to forgive. You know, my wants and my desires and my hungers are all out of order and I'm, I'm a mess. I love things I shouldn't love. I despise things that really ought to be naturally loved by me. Give me a challenge. It'll be hard for me to let go of it. That's all in me. Is it in you? What do I have to offer Him then? seems an all but impossible commandment. An invitation to do what I can't do. I'm broke. I can't pay the fee. How do I do that? I want to tell you a story that helps me some with this. It was a, I used to work, uh, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and do that. I'll say those words. How do I, how do I bless the source of blessing? Is calling for me to wake, make water wet. I, I don't bless him. He blesses me. How do I do this? Okay, back to my story. Uh, I used to work here. That's in Lubbock, Texas. That's the Moody Auditorium. It was my place of, of one of my primary duties in Lubbock, Texas. Every uh, Monday through Thursday, that room would fill up with students, and we'd have a little 15 to 20 minute worship service. If I was speaking, it was sometimes more like 35 minutes. <laughs> My wife didn't care for that joke. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we'd get there and we'd, we'd sing a couple of songs and, and then we would hear a message from somebody. There was one of the students that would sit in those pews that got really sick though. In fact, he came awful close to dying. Um, they didn't find his illness until he was right at death's door. He had a terrible tumor. They had to rush him to Dallas where he had emergency brain surgery to remove the tumor. Well, as life would have it, the, I mean, that, and that boy was delighted in by everyone who knew him. He's just a good soul. Such a good, good, good young man. Um, well, he survived. Um, but and, and as life would have it, uh, that man and the president of the university were really good friends. And so I was always supposed to secure speakers, and I didn't have to secure this speaker. The president came to me and told me that we're letting this guy tell his story. I was like, great. He got up and, and he told, I mean, it was a gut-wrenching and emotional story. But the thing that really stuck with me is one of the very first things that he said. Because he got up and he said, you know, that my son is alive, and I credit that in large part to the prayers of this university. You were his friends, and you prayed for my son. And he said, I'll never, ever be able to thank you enough. He said, I, I don't have words for that. If you want somebody to know that you love them, love their son. He said, if you, because you loved my boy, you have my eternal gratitude, my eternal debt. You were good to my son. And you have no idea what that means to me. And of course, he made the point that if you want God to be blessed, love his son. Listen to his boy. Care about his boy. Put his boy first in your life. And as father, I know what that means. Caring about him, you have no idea what that means to me. And I now know, because of this experience, he says, it so deepened my trust in God and my love for Jesus because I know what his dad, what that means to his dad. I know what you mean to me. Now, what did those people give that man? Nothing. <laughs> Everything. 
They gave that man prayer. But what they really gave that man was not a thing at all. It's intangible. They loved his son. And they were motivated to this deep and desperate prayer for that young man. And so they blessed his father out of their love and their commitment. How do we bless God? We love Him. That's it. I don't have anything really that I can give Him. Like I said, every good in me. But I can use what He's given me to love you and to love Jesus. Because if you are adopted by God, then you're God's kid. And so if I live doing good for you, then I bless the Father. I don't have anything to offer Him except this. The goodness of my being. That that if I actually live by the resources that He has been pouring into me, then I can bless God. And, And it will always surprise me every time I do it. It's a startling thing to think that I actually have in me the capacity to be a blessing to my God. But I don't think God says things that are stupid. I don't think He says meaningless things. And He said, come, bless me. You can do this. How do I do this? Give Him everything that I am. And I put all of it to work for Him. And what is the work He's called me to? Love. As I look over all of the Psalms of Ascent that are leading up to this point, I see that all of them are meant to train me to have good responses to difficult relationships. That's how I bless the Father. That this prayer life that I've spent with the Father is meant to generate a particular kind of heart in me. And it's that heart that gives honor to God. It's that nature that gives God what He wants. And God says they're saying, because you exist, my existence is better. Can you imagine God saying that about you? That's what we're for. That as you offer yourself to God, and you live as God's agent in the world, you are blessing God. The person you are is the only thing that you have to offer. And it's what He wants. What He most wants is for you to have this kind of holy life where you're good to everyone, that you're able to forgive, that you don't carry vengeance, that you live in commitment and kindness and goodness to everyone. And when you do it, you probably the, the times when you are the greatest blessing to God, You're not thinking about that. You're just thinking about being what God wants you to be. And God looks at it and says, that's my kid right there. And He looks at the person you blessed and He says, that's my kid. And I know that this person wants to bless me because they blessed my child. When we're good to one another, we're good to the Father who loves us. The commandment to lift up your hands in the holy place. This posture of worship that sometimes some of us are a little bit critical of, you know, the the person who's singing and lifts up their hands in passion, you realize that they're being obedient to Scripture when they do that. You know, that this is actually this holy thing that they're doing. Why are they doing it? It's so weird. Okay, well, maybe it's not part of, of our long history, but why do you assume any posture? Why pray on your knees? Or why pray standing or or prostate? Why do those things? Why use your body? Because when you do this, does it not stir your heart? Those of you who do it, am I telling the truth? When we lift up our hands, the use of the body does something to the soul. But I also think that this particular, in this particular psalm, the lifting up of the hands, that hand's empty. In Judaism particularly, there is a, a, how do I do worship? Well, the way that I do worship is I bring an offering. I always come with something in my hands. 
You know, I come with a goat or a bull, or, or if I'm poor, a, a couple of turtle doves. I come with grain or, or wine to pour out something in my hands. But here, it's lift up your hands. Now lift up something that I've got. Lift up your hands. It is an empty hand. It's offered to God. Why an empty hand? Because what I'm really offering God is my hand. The offering I give to God is myself. And the empty hand reminds me, nothing that I could bring to Him is worth anything to Him if I don't also give Him the hand that has the thing in it. That I want Him here to give God. I'm here to give Him that lying tongue. God, the mess that's in me, I give to You. And in the giving to You, You will change me into something that can bless Your name. God, I give to You that contempt in with which I was treated and all of the ugly stuff that's in me. I give that to You because You can handle it and I can't. God, I give to You my sinful nature. God, I give to You my fear. I give You everything that's in me so that I can give You me. Because for whatever reason, you've decided you want me. You've decided you love me. And you paid such a high price, God. So I give you an empty hand to remember there's nothing else that you want. You just want me. And I come to you with all of the mess that's in me and I give you that. And somewhere, you find a blessing for yourself when I tell you the truth about who I am and who I want to be. And I tell you and I confess to you that I'm a mess, but I don't want to be. And I ask for your help. And I try to live the life that you've put in front of me. And that He finds blessing in the making of disciples. He finds joy in the shaping of lives. He finds Himself rejoicing over us as we come to Him with all that we are and we live in love of God. When we do that, He helps us love each other. And when we do that, we bless the Lord. The startling reality is that the children of God can be a blessing to God. And that's startling, but just think about it for just a second. Those of you who are parents and have kids, do you have a greater blessing than that? Do you have a greater joy? It's startling to think that God should feel that way about us. But think about when they were small, when they were tiny. Do you remember? And when they came to you with the open hand? When they came with their hands lifted up saying, hold me. What did that do to your heart? Come, bless the Lord. Come. All that He wants is you. Being a blessing to God is what we were created to be. And it's how we were meant to live. To live as creatures that love the way that He loves, so that when He watches His children, especially in a world torn up and made a mess, filled with brokenness and sorrow and pain and sin and death, when His children step into that fray, and love as He loves, and do acts of kindness as He would do acts of kindness. And when we step into rejoicing with each other and grieving together and loving together, when we do this, don't you know God is proud? God looks at the holy disciple and says, there's My blessing on the earth. This is what I want. This is what I did it all for. So that my children could be my children, and my children are my blessing. What a wonder. This is what you were called into. And all of the work that we do, all the work we've been doing this year with the Psalms of Ascent, all the work we're going to do for the rest of the year with the Sermon on the Mount, all the work that you do as a disciple, all of the work that you do in your Christian life is so that you can become that. And you don't do that by going, well, I'll come up with something. I'll do it. 
I'll give him a... No, you do that as He works in you. As he, hasn't He been calling to you? If you've been doing the prayer work and the Psalms of Ascent, hasn't He been calling to your heart saying, come to Me, reorient, change your life, make, let Me make you whole. This is what He gets out of it all. The reason He does all the work is so that He can have children. Children who bless His heart. And here's the startling thing. We've been gathering around this campfire again and again and again. And we finally got here so that we could become blessings to God. But listen to how the psalm ends. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May the Maker of heaven and earth, the One who created it all, this was His created purpose. The reason He did the stuff in the first place. The reason for your existence is so that you could be a blessing to Him and so that He could bless you. It's all about love. It always has been. Every bit of creation is so that we can live in love with God and with one another. It's what we're for. And so as we make the journey back home, we go from Zion carrying God's blessings with us. The creatures that bless the Lord go out to be a blessing elsewhere as well. That's what we're for. Every week we make a journey into the presence of the Lord. We come here every week and we enter into God's presence and we settle into our redemption again. And we remember our salvation and we remember our discipleship so that we can make that journey out into a world that desperately needs His blessing. And in doing that, we bless the Lord. The children of God are called to be blessings. Blessings to God by being blessings to one another and blessings to the world that He so desperately loves. And when we do that, we bless God. I don't know about you, but that is a startling thought to me that I should have anything to offer Him. That He should take something from me and say, that was good for me to get it. Almighty, sovereign God, <laughs> what have I to give? And His reply is, you. I just want you. Come to me. That's all He wants. And, and look into your life. It, is this marking you? The, i got to tell you, studying for this sermon has been, like I said, a startling week for me. Again and again, I've found myself waking up going, oh God, this is, I really want to do this. Please help. If you look into your own life and you go, man, I, I need this reorientation and here's where I'm a mess and I need the prayers of, of God's people to help me because I want to do that too. If you, if you need to make things right that are a mess right now, so that you can be the blessing that you're meant to be, then we'll pray for you. It may be that you came to this place and what I've talked about, it hasn't had anything, but you came hurting and you want your brothers and sisters to know that you're hurting and you want the prayers of the saints. Let us do that. We're praying, church. We want to pray for you. And if you came to this place, you're not a Christian. There's no better way of life. And there's no hope of being a blessing without walking with Jesus Christ our Lord. If today you're subject to the invitation of God, there's room right here. Why don't you come while we stand in?